Recording by James K. White Benito Sereno By Herman Melville The Boat Appears Such were the Americans' thoughts. They were tranquilizing. There was a difference between the idea of Don Benito's darkly preordaining Captain Delano's fate and Captain Delano's lightly arranging Don Benito's. Nevertheless, it was not without something of relief that the good seaman presently perceived his whale-boat in the distance. Its absence had been prolonged by unexpected detention at the sealer's side, as well as its returning trip lengthened by the continual recession of the goal. The advancing speck was observed by the blacks. Their shouts attracted the attention of Don Benito, who, with a return of courtesy, approaching Captain Delano, expressed satisfaction at the coming of some supplies, slight and temporary as they must necessarily prove. Captain Delano responded, but while doing so his attention was drawn to something passing on the deck below. Among the crowd climbing the landward bulwarks, anxiously watching the coming boat, two blacks, to all appearances accidentally incommoded by one of the sailors, flew out against him with horrible curses, which the sailor some way resenting, the two blacks dashed him to the deck and jumped upon him, despite the earnest cries of the oakum pickers. Don Benito, said Captain Delano quickly, do you see what is going on there? Look! But, seized by his cough, the Spaniard staggered with both hands to his face, on the point of falling. Captain Delano would have supported him, but the servant was more alert, who, with one hand sustaining his master, with the other applied the cordial. Don Benito restored, the black withdrew his support, slipping aside a little, but dutifully remaining within call of a whisper. Such discretion was here evinced as quite wiped away, in the visitor's eyes, any blemish of impropriety which might have attached to the attendant, from the indecorous conferences before mentioned, showing, too, that if the servant were to blame, it might be more the master's fault than his own, since, when left to himself, he could conduct thus well. His glance thus called away from the spectacle of disorder to the more pleasing one before him, Captain Delano could not avoid again congratulating Don Benito upon possessing such a servant, who, though perhaps a little too forward now and then, must upon the whole be invaluable to one in the invalid's situation. "'Tell me, Don Benito,' he added with a smile, "'I should like to have your man here myself.' What will you take for him? Would fifty doubloons be any object? Master wouldn't part with Babo for a thousand doubloons, murmured the black, overhearing the offer, and taking it in earnest, and, with the strange vanity of a faithful slave appreciated by his master, scorning to hear so paltry a valuation put upon him by a stranger. But Don Benito apparently hardly yet completely restored, and again interrupted by his cough, made but some broken reply. Soon his physical distress became so great, affecting his mind too apparently, that, as if to screen the sad spectacle, the servant gently conducted his master below. Left to himself, the American, to while away the time till his boat should arrive, would have pleasantly accosted some one of the few Spanish seamen he saw. But recalling something that Don Benito had said touching their ill conduct, he refrained, as a shipmaster indisposed to countenance cowardice or unfaithfulness in seamen. While, with these thoughts, standing with eye directed forward toward that handful of sailors, Suddenly he thought that some of them returned the glance and with a sort of meaning. He rubbed his eyes and looked again, but again seemed to see the same thing. Under a new form, but more obscure than any previous one, 
the old suspicions recurred, but, in the absence of Don Benito, with less of panic than before. Despite the bad account given of the sailors, Captain Delano resolved forthwith to accost one of them. Descending the poop, he made his way through the blacks, his movement drawing a queer cry from the oakum pickers, prompted by whom the negroes, twitching each other aside, divided before him. But, as if curious to see what was the object of this deliberate visit to their ghetto, closing in behind, in tolerable order, followed the white stranger up. His progress thus proclaimed as by mounted kings at arms, and escorted as by a Kaffir guard of honor, Captain Delano, assuming a good-humored, off-hand air, continued to advance, now and then saying a blithe word to the negroes, and his eye curiously surveying the white faces, here and there sparsely mixed in with the blacks, like stray white pawns, venturously involved in the ranks of the chessmen opposed. While thinking which of them to select for his purpose, he chanced to observe a sailor seated on the deck engaged in tarring the strap of a large block, with a circle of blacks squatted round him inquisitively eyeing the process. The mean employment of the man was in contrast with something superior in his figure. His hand, black with continually thrusting it into the tar-pot held for him by a negro, seemed not naturally allied to his face, a face which would have been a very fine one but for its haggardness. Whether this haggardness had aught to do with criminality could not be determined, since, as intense heat and cold, though unlike, produce like sensations, so innocence and guilt, when, through casual association with mental pain, stamping any visible impress, use one seal, a hacked one. Not again that this reflection occurred to Captain Delano at the time, charitable man as he was, rather another idea. Because observing so singular a haggardness to be combined with a dark eye, averted as in trouble and shame, and then, however illogically, uniting in his mind his own private suspicions of the crew with the confessed ill opinion on the part of their captain, he was insensibly operated upon by certain general notions, which, while disconnecting pain and abashment from virtue, as invariably link them with vice. If, indeed, there be any wickedness on board this ship, thought Captain Delano, be sure that man there has fouled his hand in it, even as now he fouls it in the pitch. I don't like to accost him. I will speak to this other, this old Jack here on the windlass. He advanced to an old Barcelona tar, in ragged red breeches and dirty nightcap, cheeks trenched and bronzed, whiskers dense as thorn hedges. Seated between two sleepy-looking Africans, this mariner, like his younger shipmate, was employed upon some rigging, splicing a cable, the sleepy-looking blacks performing the inferior function of holding the outer parts of the ropes for him. Upon Captain Delano's approach, the man at once hung his head below its previous level, the one necessary for business. It appeared as if he desired to be thought absorbed, with more than common fidelity, in his task. Being addressed, he glanced up, but with what seemed a furtive, diffident air, which sat strangely enough on his weather-beaten visage, much as if a grizzly bear instead of growling and biting, should simper and cast sheep's eyes. He was asked several questions concerning the voyage, questions purposely referring to several particulars in Don Benito's narrative, not previously corroborated by those impulsive cries greeting the visitor on first coming on board. The questions were briefly answered, confirming all that remained to be confirmed of the story. The negroes about the windlass joined in with the old sailor, but, as they became talkative, he by degrees became mute, 
and at length quite glum, seemed morosely unwilling to answer more questions, and yet, all the while, this ursine air was somehow mixed with his sheepish one. Despairing of getting into unembarrassed talk with such a centaur, Captain Delano, after glancing round for a more promising countenance, but seeing none, spoke pleasantly to the blacks to make way for him, and so, amid various grins and grimaces, returned to the poop, feeling a little strange at first. He could hardly tell why, but upon the whole would regain confidence in Benito Sereno. How plainly, thought he, did that old whiskerando yonder betray a consciousness of ill desert. No doubt when he saw me coming he dreaded lest I, apprised by his captain of the crew's general misbehavior, came with sharp words for him, and so down with his head. And yet, and yet, now that I think of it, that very old fellow, if I err not, was one of those who seemed so earnestly eyeing me here a while since. Ah, these currents spin one's head round almost as much as they do the ship. Huh. There now's a pleasant sort of sunny sight. Quite sociable, too. His attention had been drawn to a slumbering negress partly disclosed through the lacework of some rigging, lying with youthful limbs, carelessly disposed, under the lee of the bulwarks, like a doe in the shade of a woodland rock. Sprawling at her lapped breasts was her wide-awake fawn, stark naked, its black little body half-lifted from the deck, crosswise with its dams, its hands like two paws clambering upon her, its mouth and nose ineffectually rooting to get at the mark and meantime giving a vexatious half-grunt, blending with the composed snore of the negress. The uncommon vigor of the child at length roused the mother. She started up, at distance, facing Captain Delano, but, as if not at all concerned at the attitude in which she had been caught, delightedly she caught the child up, with maternal transports, covering it with kisses. There's naked nature now. Pure tenderness and love, thought Captain Delano, well pleased. This incident prompted him to remark the other negresses more particularly than before. He was gratified with their manners. Like most uncivilized women, they seemed at once tender of heart and tough of constitution, equally ready to die for their infants or fight for them unsophisticated as leopardesses, loving as doves. Ah, thought Captain Delano, these perhaps are some of the very women whom Mungo Park saw in Africa, and gave such a noble account of. These natural sights somehow insensibly deepened his confidence and ease. At last he looked to see how his boat was getting on, but it was still pretty remote. He turned to see if Don Benito had returned, but he had not. To change the scene, as well as to please himself with a leisurely observation of the coming boat, stepping over into the mizzen chains, he clambered his way into the starboard quarter galley, one of those abandoned Venetian-looking water balconies previously mentioned, retreats cut off from the deck. As his foot pressed the half-damp, half-dry sea-mosses matting the place, and a chance phantom cat's paw, an islet of breeze, unheralded, unfollowed, as this ghostly cat's paw came fanning his cheek, his glance fell upon the row of small, round deadlights, all closed like coppered eyes of the coffin, and the state cabin door, once connecting with the gallery, even as the dead lights had once looked out upon it, but now cocked fast like a sarcophagus lid to a purple-black tarred-over panel, threshold, and post. And he bethought him of the time when that state cabin and the state balcony had heard the voices of the Spanish king's officers 
and the forms of the Lima Viceroy's daughters had perhaps leaned where he stood. As these and other images flitted through his mind, as the cat's paw through the calm, gradually he felt rising a dreamy inquietude, like that of one who alone on the prairie feels unrest from the repose of the noon. He leaned against the carved balustrade, again looking off toward his boat, but found his eye falling upon the ribbon grass, trailing along the ship's waterline, straight as a border of green box, and parterres of seaweed, broad ovals and crescents, floating nigh and far, with what seemed long formal alleys between, crossing the terraces of swells, and sweeping round, as if leading to the grottoes below. And overhanging all was the balustrade by his arm, which, partly stained with pitch and partly embossed with moss, seemed the charred ruin of some summer-house in a grand garden long running to waste. Trying to break one charm, he was but becharmed anew, though upon the wide sea he seemed in some far inland country, prisoner in some deserted chateau, left to stare at empty grounds, and peer out at vague roads where never wagon or wayfarer passed. But these enchantments were a little disenchanted as his eye fell on the corroded main chains, of an ancient style, massy and rusty in link, shackle and bolt, they seemed even more fit for the ship's present business than the one for which probably she had been built. Presently, he thought something moved nigh the chains. He rubbed his eyes and looked hard. Groves of rigging were about the chains, and there, peering from behind a great stay, like an Indian from behind a hemlock, a Spanish sailor, a marling spike in his hand, was seen, who made what seemed an imperfect gesture toward the balcony. But immediately, as if alarmed by some advancing step along the deck within, vanished into the recesses of the hempen forest, like a poacher. What meant this? Something the man had sought to communicate, unbeknown to anyone, even to his captain? Did the secret involve aught unfavorable to his captain? Were those previous misgivings of Captain Delano's about to be verified? Or, in his haunted mood at the moment, had some random, unintentional motion of the man, while busy with the stay, as if repairing it, been mistaken for a significant beckoning? Not unbewildered, again he gazed off for his boat, but it was temporarily hidden by a rocky spur of the isle, as with some eagerness he bent forward, watching for the first shooting view of its beak, the balustrade gave way before him like charcoal. Had he not clutched an outreaching rope, he would have fallen into the sea. The crash, though feeble, and the fall, though hollow, of the rotten fragments must have been overheard. He glanced up. With sober curiosity, Peering down upon him was one of the old oakum pickers, slipped from his perch to an outside boom, while below the old negro, and, invisible to him, reconnoitering from a porthole like a fox from the mouth of its den, crouched the Spanish sailor again. From something suddenly suggested by the man's air, the mad idea now darted into Captain Delano's mind that Don Benito's plea of indisposition in withdrawing below was but a pretense, that he was engaged there maturing some plot of which the sailor, by some means gaining an inkling, had a mind to warn the stranger against, incited, it may be, by gratitude for a kind word on first boarding the ship. Was it from foreseeing some possible interference like this that Don Benito had beforehand given such a bad character of his sailors while praising the Negroes, though indeed the former seemed as docile as the latter the contrary? 
The whites, too, by nature, were the shrewder race. A man with some evil design, would not he be likely to speak well of that stupidity which was blind to his depravity, and malign that intelligence from which it might not be hidden? Not unlikely, perhaps. But if the whites had dark secrets concerning Don Benito, could then Don Benito be any way in complicity with the blacks? But they were too stupid. Besides, who ever heard of a white so far a renegade as to apostatize from his very species almost by leaguing in against it with negroes? These difficulties recalled former ones. Lost in their mazes, Captain Delano, who had now regained the deck, was uneasily advancing along it, when he observed a new face, an aged sailor seated cross-legged near the main hatchway. His skin was shrunk up with wrinkles like a pelican's empty pouch. His hair frosted, his countenance grave and composed. His hands were full of ropes, which he was working into a large knot, some blacks were about him, obligingly dipping the strands for him here and there, as the exigencies of the operation demanded. Captain Delano crossed over to him, and stood in silence surveying the knot. His mind, by a not uncongenial transition, passing from its own entanglements to those of the hemp. For intricacy such a knot he had never seen, in an American ship, or, indeed, any other. The old man looked like an Egyptian priest making Gordian knots for the temple of Amon. The knot seemed a combination of double bowline knot, treble crown knot, backhanded well knot, knot in and out knot, and jamming knot. At last, puzzled to comprehend the meaning of such a knot, Captain Delano addressed the knotter. "'What are you knotting there, my man?' "'The knot,' was the brief reply, without looking up. "'So it seems, but what is it for?' "'For someone else to undo,' muttered back the old man, plying his fingers harder than ever, the knot being now nearly completed. While Captain Delano stood watching him, Suddenly the old man threw the knot toward him, and said in broken English, the first heard in the ship, something to this effect. Undo it. Cut it quick. It was said lowly, but with such condensation of rapidity, that the long, slow words in Spanish, which had preceded and followed, almost operated as covers to the brief English between. For a moment, not in hand and not in head, Captain Delano stood mute, while, without further heeding him, the old man was now intent upon other ropes. Presently there was a slight stir behind Captain Delano. Turning, he saw the chained negro, Atu Fall, standing quietly there. The next moment the old sailor rose, muttering, and, followed by his subordinate negroes, removed to the forward part of the ship, where, in the crowd, he disappeared. An elderly negro, in a clout like an infant's, and with a pepper-and-salt head, and a kind of attorney air, now approached Captain Delano. In tolerable Spanish, and with a good-natured knowing wink, he informed him that the old knotter was simple-witted, but harmless, often playing his old tricks. The negro concluded by begging the knot, for, of course, the stranger would not care to be troubled with it. Unconsciously, it was handed to him. With a sort of conga, the negro received it, and, turning his back, ferreted into it like a detective custom-house officer, after smuggled laces. Soon, with some African word equivalent to psh, he tossed the knot overboard. 
End of chapter 6 Recording by James K. White Chula Vista